could please, if somebody is talking too much next to you, just tap them gently on the shoulder. Because we do want everyone to really be paying attention. This is an important conversation, as you can see. We've been having this conversation for a long, long time. This conversation should have started a few hundred years ago. But, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing that we're talking about it today. Uh, this is Busboys and Poets. And I have to be honest with you, when I first was thinking of opening this place, this is exactly what I had in mind. Yeah. It's this kind of gathering where it brings people of all different backgrounds and races and ethnicities together and get uplifted, a feeling, a sense of uplifting. This is a place where art, culture, and politics come together and intentionally collide. This is a place to share your thoughts, your ideas, to nourish your mind, body, and soul. We believe by creating spaces like this, you really do begin to change the way people think, you change the narrative, and you do change the world. Um, I am thrilled to have with us here some real change makers. Um, first of all, I want to say a very, very, very special thank you to uh, Angela Davis and Gina Dent. I was, I was concerned about the weather might deter them, but uh, when, I, when, I, when I saw Angela, she said, what, a little rain? We need rain in California. You should give us some. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have both of them here. We really appreciate your time and your energy to come here. Thank you so much. Um, and this is, of course, one of two events that we're going to be doing with, with, uh, with Dr. Davis. We're going to be also having our anniversary event uh, tomorrow, our 10th year anniversary, which will take place at Brookland. But I want to I welcome Angela to Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. So. We, we decided to put this, this panel together rather quickly um, as soon as Dr. Davis decided that she will do this. Uh, so we put this together. And of course, I went around finding uh, three people that I think are really important and instrumental in this conversation. Uh, of course, Erica Totten, who's sitting right next to Angela there. And I'm going to give you just a brief bio. For those of you that may not know her, she is a, a wife, a mother, educator, healer, spiritual life coach, and community organizer, and she is that, who continues to work tirelessly for the fight for black liberation. She is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter DMV, where she focuses on coalition building nationally and abroad, disrupting the status quo. Thank you for being here, Erica. Next to Erica, we have the one and only Kimon Freeman. He is a poet, a playwright, an activist, a father, and director of the National Black, Black Love Festival. It's one of the largest festivals that happen here in Washington, D.C., and as well uh, as being the founder of that, he is a program director and co-owner of Newton Media Group and We Act Radio. <laughs> WPWC 1480 AM. And of course, a lot of you know this man, Eugene Perrier. Eugene is a DC-based activist and graduate of Howard. He, he ran for an open seat for the DC Council, endorsed by, uh, he, was, he, was a, he was endorsed and he was the nominee for the Green Party here in Washington, the Green Statehood Party. And he is an incredible organizer, activist, and a speaker. Just wonderful to hear him here. And of course, Angela Davis does not need any introduction, but she is <laughs> activist, scholar, writer, has always been tireless advocating for the press, advocating for prison reform, for equity and justice for everyone. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Thank you. So we're... We're trying to put together this event as a town hall. Now, it's really difficult to do a, a town hall, so don't take us literally. We're, we're, we're not going to go too far with the mic and bring it back. It makes it a little more difficult. But we will take questions from the audience. But I want to begin, and, and you know, there's been a lot of conversation about Black Lives Matter and if this movement is effective, what has it done, what hasn't it done, and so on. And I want to get a little bit of perspective. So I want to start, if you don't mind, with you, Dr. Davis, to give us a little perspective, having been during the civil rights movement, have been involved in, in many 
black movements, black liberation uh, struggles. What are the differences, what are the similarities you see today vis-a-vis -vis this, this movement as opposed to the Black Panthers or other movements that have taken place in history? That's a big question. <laughs> but first of all, it's really wonderful to be here in D.C. at Bus Boys and Poets. And it's great to see all of you who've come out on this rainy evening. Uh, what I would say is that, um, first of all, I'm really excited about the new developments among young people and the emergence of new movements, uh, Black Lives Matter, organizations like Black Lives Matter and Dream Defenders and um, the Black Youth Project and the Justice League. Um, and I think it's a very new era. Unfortunately, many people of my generation uh, can't really manage to find their way um, among and around this new movement because it doesn't display the characteristics that we are familiar with. Uh, there is no single leader. And so people are asking, where are the leaders? Who are the leaders? Uh, what is the agenda? And one of the things that I find so exciting about uh, uh, these new movements is the fact that finally women, black women, <laughs> Black women are at the fore now in virtually all of the black liberation movements we have uh, witnessed during the last century. Women have always been the major organizers. They've always been the major organizers. Uh, however, the spokespeople have been men. And so what I find so exciting is that these new movements demonstrate that we no longer need this stereotypical notion of a movement where there is a, um, a black charismatic male leader, a single black charismatic male leader. What I find really important is the notion of collective leadership which we've really needed all along. So I can say that I'm really excited about these uh, new developments. They're very different from what we experienced in the, during the 60s, very different from the movements in the 30s, uh, probably different from the movements uh, around the turn of the century, because I think about the fact that uh, that out of the organizing around organizations like the NAACP emerged um, figures like W.E.B. Du Bois, whom I revere and admire, but figures like Ida B. Wells, Ida B. Wells Burnett, never received the credit that they would do. So I think I'll, I have a lot to say, but I think I'll end uh, with, with that observation about gender and uh, the new movement. We'll be hearing more. So um, I want to I want to move over to uh, to Erica and 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 Kimon and Eugene. I think to ask the question about intersectionality. That's a very important question. I think that's been addressed. The idea of intersectionality of this movement. Where are the uh, the Venn diagrams? How are they developing? And how is the movement moving forward uh, as? in relationship to other movements that are taking place. So let's begin with you, Erica. Um, one, thank you for, for opening it with that um, and for affirming me, affirming the leadership um, that we have in this city. So many of the leaders are right here in this room. Um, and so I just thank you again for that. Um, so the role of intersection, the, the importance of intersectionality um, in this movement has um, been centered. And you see that in our, reflected in our organizing in this city. You may not have seen that in the beginning, but some of us have had to separate to make sure 
that we are centering the voices of the most marginalized in our community, um, being black women, black trans women, black queer folk, black LGBTQ. And so in the beginning, we didn't have that space. Um, we, in the beginning, we may have fallen back into that, well, the, the men are making the noise, or they have the funds, or they have the banners, or, or things like that. And early on, we saw erasure um, in the movement here in DC. And so we did something about that. So ultimately, um, Dory Ladner told me, the wonderful elder, when they, she said, if they don't have you at the table, kick the damn legs from underneath the table. <laughs> and those are the type of elders that we need and that, had, that the universe has brought into my life to affirm the way that I disrupt, um, which we all do. Um, and so that's really different from, from what we've seen before. And so we have elders like Dr. Davis and Dory Ladner that are affirming how we do this work and we release respectability politics, we release misogyny, all of that stuff that are, that are barriers to getting shit done. That's ultimately what it is. If you are blocking our way with misogyny or homophobia, trans antagonism, all of those isms, then we moving you out the way and we are gonna continue doing the work. And that's what we've done in this city. So and I'm very, very proud of that. And folks ended up getting in line. They released misogyny, they released homophobia, and are now speaking the language of all black lives. Not just straight black men, but all black lives. Uh, I want to continue on the vein of intersectionality, and I want to also add, add a little bit more to the question. The idea that the word black makes people nervous. It makes white people nervous, it makes the establishment nervous, uh, we, we use the word African-American. It turns me on. What was that? It turns me on. You big black. <laughs> All right. Uh, it, it <laughs> I know you too well, Kimon. Um, but, but so we use the word African-American. We try to kind of put it, couch it in a certain uh, decorum. So when, when uh, a, lot of, a lot of white folks feel uncomfortable, or establishment folks even, feel uncomfortable with the idea of Black Lives Matter as a standalone in and of itself. So they try to co-opt it and put other words in there, like all lives matter, or uh, you know, everybody's lives matter, or all of those other things. There's a, there's a nuance there that is, for, that is missed in the, in, the, in the conversation. Can you explain a little bit about, about that and why the Black Lives Matter is such an important element in and of itself? Uh, first, I have to say that it's an honor to, to share the, this, this, this space with this warrior sister, this warrior queen right here, who I've uh, been a fan of for a very long time. And anyone that has, is despised by Ronald Reagan is, is truly an honor. <laughs> it's truly an honor. And as, and as many of us cheer for that, in sharing our honor of being despised by Ronald Reagan, unfortunately, the same people are honoring the man who admires Ronald Reagan, and we're distracted by the beauty of his family and the clothes that his wife's wear instead of paying attention to what he's actually doing. Footnote, message. Okay. Uh, back to your question. Uh, the term black uh, is, is basically... Uh, a word that has a negative connotation throughout the English language. The only time the word black is used positive is when it is in reference to making money, honey. This is direct relationship to the original counting system, which was slavery. Uh, they tried to enslave the, the Native Americans. They called them the red man. They lost money in that, in that effort. They uh, enslaved black Africans. They made this country with that effort. Hence the present day accounting terms, when you're making money, you were in the, you're losing money, you end up. The, there we go, Black Friday, okay? So when we say Black Lives Matter, yes, it's unsettling to a lot of people. I've been doing a Black Love Festival uh, since 1997 with, with limited funds. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and I've, not just white folks, Mostly, mostly by black people. Why I gotta be a black love festival? Why can't it just be a love festival? 
I said, why I got to be a white house? Why can't it just be the house? You got a problem with me, but you ain't got a problem with them. So we are bringing to bear all the miseducation that we have been taught. We've been taught that everything black is bad, everything white is good, so just by affirming our goodness has to be, if I say black love, then that must mean in a colonized mindset, white hate. And that's not what this is about. This is about self-preservation, it's about acknowledging it. And the reason why this, this movement is very, very difficult is because we don't have a clear set goal. The goal is to dismantle white supremacy. No one knows what that looked like. White su see, black, a lot of people have trouble still saying that. Everybody say white supremacy. Okay, because some people got trouble saying it. And I don't know why. It's been the dominant doctrine for the past 500 years. Now, for the good white folks in here, when we say white supremacists, oh, excuse me, white supremacy, that does not mean white supremacists. Okay, white supremacy is you have an Asian movie, Asian cast, Asian actors, as an Asian film for Asian people. You have a Latino movie with Latino cast, Latino director, it's for Latino people. If you have an all white everything, it's for everybody. It's just a film. Why has to be? That's white supremacy. So we're dismantling that, okay? So I wanna speak, I'm trying to speak to that question, but real quick on this footnote, I want everybody to raise your hand if you have ever, black people, this is a black question, if you have ever had a negative encounter with the police, raise your hand. Please get your cameras. Take hold it up high. Please get your cameras. Get somebody get a shot of that. Okay? Thank you very much. Now, my good white folks, if you have had a negative encounter with the police, raise your hand. Someone get a picture of that. Well, it's worth a thousand words. The person that raises his hand is, is Jeff Zinn. He happens to be Howard Zinn's son. Hey, so, give, him, uh, give him up right here. Salute, sir. Salute. 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 Well, I think the reason that Black Lives Matter is, is important uh, is it challenges power. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I hear you, Kimon. I just think that we have to recognize White supremacy also doesn't exist in a vacuum either. I mean, it's really the product of the genocide of Native Americans and the slave, uh, slavery of black people here in this country, which is all about the creation of capitalism in this nation. And so I think one of the things to speak to the intersectionality piece too, that you know, around the country, just about everyone who's claiming Black Lives Matter in some way, shape, or form. Yes. Should I start again? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Got to do what the people want. So the point I was making is that I think the reason Black Lives Matter is important is because it challenges power. And white supremacy doesn't exist in a vacuum, but it exists as the product of the necessity of the genocide of Native Americans and the enslavement of African people to build up this capitalist imperialist system in America. And I think that's one of the things from an intersectionality piece that most of us, all the people I know here who are affiliated with some sort of Black Lives Matter organization are 100% clear about, is that there is a system, it has a name, it's called capitalism, and all of these things work as tools to enforce that kind of profit making. So when you say Black Lives Matter, all of the privilege, all of the wealth, all of the power, all of the hierarchies that have been created since 1776 are all called into question. And it's happening at a time where all of that, and I think Erica spoke to this very well in terms of patriarchy, in terms of the LGBTQ community, where all of the sort of traditional assumptions, assumptions of this imperialist, racist, hetero patriarchal society are all being called into question at one time and it's all happening focused on one slogan and I think it scares a lot of people when you say it because it really affects their everyday life and existence. It's not a meaningless slogan. I think Dr. Davis wanted to say something. Historically, um, black people, people of color, have uh, suffered under what you might call the tyranny of universal uh, concepts. Uh, so why has, as you were pointing out, the universal always been colored white? Uh, so when we talk about who counts as a human being, uh, uh, historically, people of color were even excluded 
from the very concept of human beings. So that when people say now that, oh, uh, uh, we should be more all-embracing, we should say that all lives matter, uh, that has been said forever. And it's time to focus on the particular. It's time to focus on the specific. It's time to say black lives matter. It's time to say black differently able lives matter. Black queer lives matter. No, black working class lives matter. And in saying that, in saying that, we are saying that all lives matter. But I think this, um, this, is going to require a lot of discussion for a long time uh, because um, be precisely because of white supremacy, it's very difficult to imagine black as being the universal. And I was thinking um, about uh, the Haitian constitution that uh, Jacques de Saline wrote. And in that constitution, and by the way, Haiti was the first, Haiti was the first democratic country in the non-racial democracy in the world. And so when one considers that when the con that particular constitution was written, all citizens of Haiti were to be considered black. That is to say, white citizens of Haiti would also be black, because black was equivalent to citizenship. Uh, and it seems to me that we have to begin to think about what it means when those who have been historically marginalized and subjugated and oppressed become the very um, possibility of freedom, become the sign for a new notion of democracy. So it seems to me that Black Lives Matter contains you know, all of these, uh, these, these notions that uh, we have to address if we are going to eventually overturn uh, white su racism and white supremacy. Um, just staying on the theme of white supremacy, I think white supremacy thrives in structures, known structures. Um, so I want to bring up, maybe this is a little bit peripheral, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience, but I want to bring up the phenomenon of ta Coates. Coats. Um, and a lot of people have maybe different perspectives on him, but certainly he's become the darling of so many, so many people. He just won a MacArthur, he's been writing like crazy uh, on, the, on, the top, on the top pages of every newspaper and so on. Uh, there's an article um, in the Black Agenda by Pascal Robert, who writes about him. He says, uh, he challenges the status quo about as much as Jiffy peanut butter. He says that Tanasi Coates has been listening to way too much hip hop music. And then he says that he enables the most noxious form of racial essentialism. So. I don't know if any of you want to take that on because I think it's an important issue that uh, what, what the, the idea is that ta Coates has sort of fit into the paradigm of white liberals, making them feel like, uh-huh, I know I've been racist, but there's been a reason why I've been racist, and therefore it must not be a problem. You know, it's not me, it's the other. And so I want you to... I don't know if any of you want to take that on to have, maybe you, starting with you, Eugene. Well, I got to take my fellow Howard grad. Uh, hey, yeah, you want, you want? Hey, Chu. You All right, it's homecoming this weekend, so I just had to check. Uh, you know, I, I think that in some ways it's, it's, it's spot on, right? I, I think that the reason why Tana Hesse has been able to get into people is he, has fit in me, you know, he's working for The Atlantic Magazine, they gave him a little bit of range, because you know, most times when black writers, you write in a mainstream thing, you can only write about black people, but they write about the Civil War, different things like that, people see who he is, it humanizes him a little bit, and I think you're right in the sense, and the, and the critique is right in the sense that he also raises it in a way that is non-threatening. 
And I think that's the key, right? Because in a way, he can make you uncomfortable, or some people uncomfortable, by just telling the truth about racism in America, but by not raising any, and I hate to say quote unquote demands, but that was the big criticism of the book, right? Is he didn't say what you should do about it, then it makes the criticism safe. Because it's like, well, you know, yeah, it's bad that there's racism and it's a shame that, you know, I just bought an apartment in Mount Vernon Square and it's getting so gentrified. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just, there's nothing I can really do about it. Because that's what you get at the end. And I think that's why people are critiquing him is that you can make the world's strongest critique, but then if you don't call on people to do something to rectify it, they assume there is no answer or that someone else is working on it and thus they are not required to. And then it makes them easier and, and more palatable to take down. And I, I think that's what we, I mean, you know, the reparations piece, he didn't say one new thing that hadn't been said before about reparations. But he said it in the Atlantic, and he said it by just saying, shouldn't we just at least study it? When before it was, we need reparations now. And it was like, yeah, we need reparations. I'm not saying let's do it, let's just study it. So that kind of, the end result, I think, is what helps him slide by. Anybody else want to take that on? Um, I just have to answer like this. Until, we ha until the lions have the historians, the tales of the hunt will continue to glorify the, the hunters. Uh, I am glad that Ta-Nehisi is, is successful. I'm glad to hear his voice is a welcoming addition. However, he has editors, he works for someone, he has a boss. It's just like in the movie business. You have the writer version, that is the script. You have the director's version, that's what gets shot. Then you have the studio's version, and that's what you see. And we gotta never take an eye off the ball that there's a system, and he's just part of a system. So what you're getting is, may not actually be 100% a reflection of where he is, or what they agree upon, or uh, uh, you know, submit to. So I just want to put that out there before I throw him under the bus. Okay. Uh, so let's, let, let, let me say something. I, I don't know if this is working now. You want to try it again? Is this working? See if it's working real close. Uh, yeah, much better. Okay, is this working? Yeah. Well. Okay. Um, You know, I actually think it's good that he's doing what he's doing. Not that I would do it in that way. But I think that it's also creating more space for people to take more radical positions. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to assume that, that uh, there is only one approach and we know the answer. And therefore we can't embrace those who may be um, not as radical as we think we are. So I'm actually glad that he's putting those ideas out there because it makes it easier for us to complicate them and to point out that we have to go a bit further. He just wrote that, um, that long article in the uh, Atlantic about uh, the black family in the age of mass incarceration. And so that gives us the opportunity to say that, you know, it's not just about mass in incarceration, it's about a prison industrial complex. And we have to talk about the profitability of punishment. You know, like I was actually glad that Obama is finally breaking his silence. Uh, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that he's showing us the direction we ought to be moving in, but it will make it a bit easier for us to do the radical organizing we should be doing today. All right, so uh, any, any questions? I'll start with here and then we'll move back. Good evening. Oh. Hello, hello. All right. So um, once again, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for blessing us with your presence tonight. I really appreciate that. Um, earlier on, um, our interviewer asked you what were, you know, to compare a contraction movement of the 50s and the 60s to today. And you made a statement about how um, your generation, our elders, don't necessarily know how to navigate through the movement because it's a little bit different than how it is today. Um, me, as a 25-year-old black woman, my mother told me from the moment I was eight or nine, you always have to work twice as hard. One, because you're black. Two, because you're a woman. I never understood that, but it's still a seed that she planted, and I, I see that today. Um, my question to you is, um, likewise, we are still trying to figure out how to navigate our own movement. And 
How do I, as a 25-year-old black woman, put myself in a position to ask for counsel of elders who are not positioning themselves in our community? So you're asking, how will you be able to call for a council of elders that will be, that will play what role? Well, um, I hear a lot, especially with dealing with everything that's been going on in Baltimore recently about um, those young people, look at them, they're tearing up their own city. Uh, what are they doing? However, these are elders who are sitting at home behind television and not positioning themselves in a community to be of counsel. My godfather, he's been a Pan-African. Um, my grandfather's a black nationalist and they always told me, elders are for counsel, youth are for war. And it's not that we're not ready to fight, but we still need that counsel or else we're just gonna channel all this energy that we have and not dispense it correctly. And so I just want to know, how do we put ourselves in a position to be able to receive counsel and to ask questions without being called disrespectful or being told that we're not listening? Because the issues are still the same. And I understand that your generation may see that, yes, I can get on the bus now and sit at the front, or I can drink from this fountain, or I can go to this university, but our problems are still very real. I understand that overt racism was really present, and I'm not saying that it's not today, however, the problems that you guys face are as significant as me being denied a home loan or, or going out into my community and seeing a Planned Parenthood while white people have fertility clinics. And so these are all things that anger us, but we still ourselves are trying to figure out how to navigate through our own movement, but we don't have that counsel. We, we're basically saying we don't mind receiving counsel from the elders, but they have to position themselves and know that we are not enemies. Right. Yeah, that's a really good question. That is an excellent question, and I wish I had the answer. But what I can say is that what we might really need, as opposed to um, um, a hierarchical relationship between young people and older people, what we might need is more intergenerational um, uh, relationships and intergenerational learning. Uh, just as young people should be able to learn from the experiences that those of us have had who've been in this movement for a half century or more. But on the other hand, older people, elders, have to be able to learn what is new. Unfortunately, one of the characteristics of age is to forget youth, is to forget when we were young and what it felt like to be exploring uh, things with this sense of curiosity about the world uh, and uncovering new ideas and new approaches. That is what being a warrior is all about. So when you say that the youth are the warriors, I would say the youth are um, moving into uh, unexplored terrain and are acquiring new knowledges, new ideas about what it is going to take to bring about radical change. And so, you know, just as you know, Erica and my brothers were pointing out, all of these intersectional issues, that was not available to us uh, 40 years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, I always like to point out, we were involved in the black liberation movement and our slogan was free the black man. And although the women were doing more of the organizing work, we did not even realize that we weren't organizing on our own behalf. So that now we understand the intersectionality of struggles, uh, so that we address racism and um, heteropatriarchy, misogyny, uh, transphobia, homophobia, um, uh, discrimination against differently able, able people. You know how to do that much better than we because you're beginning to take for granted that this is the way the movement should look. And so this is what you have to offer to us, uh, that sense of a new normal, that sense of a new way to think about what it means to struggle for freedom.
Thank you. I want, I want to turn that to you as, as well, Eric. I think that was the question for you as well. Yeah. Uh, what has been your experience in reaching out to elders, or do you? Do you want elders to get involved in this? Um, I, I'm very careful on the elders that I seek counsel from. I think a lot of times we romanticize elder, um, and a lot, I w I, I'm not going to say a lot. Many of our elders have yet to deconstruct their own internalized white supremacy, and so they're teaching us out of that frame. Um, and so I'm very careful. Um, there are certain things, I'm very particular about the elders that I seek counsel from. Um, and so far, it's only been two. It's been my mom and Dory Ladner. That's what I got. And now it's Dr. Davis. <laughs> um, because some of our elders have let us down. Um, and they don't affirm us. And they don't understand why we're out in the streets all the time. They want us to be quiet. Um, they want us to shut up. But a lot of times, it's for our safety. But they don't recognize that we are fearless. Right, they already killing us, so we are gonna make some noise if we going out. Um, so you gotta be able to understand that too, that there are certain elders that have yet to deconstruct their own brokenness and their own fear, living, for, living longer in a white supremacist system than we have. So they have been, there's some, I wouldn't even say there's apathy, ultimately it's fear and trauma that they've experienced that are, that are keeping them paralyzed to action. And so recognizing that and being very particular about it. And I think you're also disrupting the, the power base. You know, when you have elders that have earned that label and have been entrenched in the system, as you say, when you start questioning those norms that you're, you're disrupting, it's not just fear for your life, it's fear for their power as well. So yeah. oh, let's go back here. Appreciate that. Um, no I'm just, here, let me move over away from the microphone. Um, hi, Angela. I'm a huge, like, you're my idol. But um, that aside, I really, um, so with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, kind of moving away from the norms of, like, you know, heteropatriarchal, um, cisgender men, I think there's also an issue of colorism that exists within the black community. And so while we're deconstructing white supremacy as it exists amongst white folks, um, against black people, there's also an inter, um, like, you know, internalized white supremacy that exists in the black community. And so being an organizer in Louisiana, where I went to undergrad, um, one of the biggest criticisms I got being a light-skinned person was, you know, that I couldn't be pro-black or that um, because I'm light-skinned, that passing privilege, you know, light-skinned privilege. And while that all, all exists, I just kind of wanted to um, see people address, like within the Black Lives Matter movement, address the issue of colorism as it exists within the black community because um, it's very, it, you know, it exists and I think that continuing to ignore it or kind of to glaze over it as it not being a priority um, is like, you know, further diminishing issues that exist in the black community. So if you could speak on that, I would, that would be like, that'd be my life. So thank you. <laughs> Who wants to take that on? She wants to hear from me. Okay. Yeah. And then I can tell you what's in DC. Okay. To I'll just say that, yeah, of course it's important. It really is important. Uh, and, um, you know, there are many, many ways, numerous ways in which we internalize racism and, and, and white supremacy. and. You know, colorism in that sense is one of them, but I can't ask the question about how it's being, I can't answer the question about how it's being dealt with in the context of the new young movements, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. So I'd like to ask um, Erica to uh, address that issue. Um, what, tell me your name, Blair. Are you in DC? Okay, so one of the ways in which um, we are unchaining ourselves from the internalized white supremacy is through what I host every Wednesday called Emotional Emancipation Circles. And so with that, it's a safe space to be able to identify the chains that we have, the, thing, the chains that we put on ourselves, the chains that other people put on us. 
And colorism is one of those issues that we deal with. Um, and it's a safe space to be able to talk about your experiences of feeling excluded, of feeling um, of not having your blackness be affirmed because I love my blackness and yours. And that is one of the mantras that we have as well. And so one of the ways in which we're doing it here, I don't know how we're doing it in other, in other cities, but I'm very intentional about, because what you're talking about is trauma, right? Um, and so being able, and it's other black people who have experienced their own trauma and are projecting that onto you. And so the circle is for them too because both need to be healed, right? So emotional emancipation circles every Wednesday at the Emergence Community Arts Collective, um, 6.30 to 8.30, but we can talk about those things. Um, but you have to be able to address that trauma in a safe space that affirms your blackness is for all black people. There are many people that have, in the, in, everybody in the circle who came to the circle? Yeah. Um, so we, we do that every Wednesday and that's really where we experience that healing um, to be able to move forward, because you got to deal with the trauma. All right, we have we have. Uh, uh, Andy, let me just let me just make right. one other point. I I thought it might be important to point out that the way we use black as opposed to African American is as a political concept, uh, um, and you know, oftentimes we assume that when we say black, we're simply referring to color, we're referring to some kind of biological uh, phenomenon. But we're talking about a political uh, um, category, we're talking about a political belongingness and solidarity. And this is why I think that so many people in the establishment fear the notion black. Because when you say African American, that um, that prevents us from expressing solidarity with black people in Africa and in the Caribbean and Brazil and everywhere in the world. And black, black, the struggle for black liberation historically has been the struggle for freedom in the world. And that's why we identify as black. I think, I think the other thing, the other reason why, why black is so scary is because it, it creates a sense of equity uh, with, with the word white. Uh, whereas when you're hyphenating words, you make them subservient to the dominant, which is white. That's why we, you know, even, and it's, it's really a brilliant setup because even Native Americans have become hyphenated and they were the first ones here uh, before anybody else showed up here. So Native Americans, Arab Americans, African Americans, and so on, and then white. And then they're Americans. And then they're Americans, right. Like, I, I, I remember as someone who came here uh, to this country, people would say, oh, they're American. They mean white American, like automatically. You just assume that's what that means. If they were black, they'd say they're black. If they were something else, they'd say they're something. But you're American, assuming you're European American. But nobody uses that moniker of European American. It's used as white. Um, so I'm going to do this uh, because I know a lot of hands are in front. I'm going to take two more in the front, then I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to take a couple questions there, and then we'll go in the back room and take a couple questions. So hang in there, please. All right? So we're going to you, and then to you, Peggy, and then all the way to the back. Uh, my name is Victor Valentino Pierce. I came from Washington State to Washington, D.C., and I'm so thankful, first of all, giving glory and honor to God that I'm able to be here today with my fellow human beings, not just African Americans, because this isn't just a message for African Americans, but it's to all of humanity, to our spiritual inner self, as well as our physical essence of what we appear on the outside, because we all are a part of the rainbow. Now, in saying that, the rainbow of God, in saying that, I believe that our African heritage that has been identified even with the strength and the power of Martin Luther King, he recognized all that and he projected and he portrayed all of that and here we are 50 years from now, 
and he still has that baton in his hand, and he still wants to transfer that baton to us, and I am sharing with him in that essence. I believe that one of the problems of us as being African Americans is our identification with us as Africans and Americans. We should be one. The, all the one, other what? races, one, my question is one, this. All the, other, all the other races have been identified within their own home component. How have we been disenfranchised with ourselves in dealing with the government and empowering ourselves to come together and unite with our fellow Africans and Americans working together so that we could be recognized by the government of the United States. All right. Uh, uh, hey, ladies and gentlemen, can we have everybody please be quiet? Remember the rule we had at the beginning? If somebody's talking, tap them on the shoulder gently and let them know to please keep it down. This is a real experience for everybody to enjoy, to be able to have such great people here on the panel. Please give them the respect to be quiet for just the next few minutes. Thank you. So does anybody want to take that on for a second? I'm a, I, I touch on it. Black people are the mamas and papas of the earth and civilization. Niggas was made in America. So we have a conflict. Uh, and in resolution of that conflict, uh, it has to be a question of equity. And um, I, I don't think there can be any peace until we have equity. Um, on the, my beautiful sister that had the light skin um, issues, I will arm you with this. Point out Huey P. Newton, light, bright, damn near white, black, and anybody in here. Clarence Thomas, dark as anybody in here, and his biggest seller I've ever seen in my life. So that is not an accurate measurement. And whoever is saying that to you, as she's, the sister said, are projecting their insecurities and, re, and, and actually practicing uh, white supremacy themselves. All and right. then my sister that wanted to question on the elders, I would do what Erica Tan do, bum rush the stage if you don't like what they're saying, okay? And in terms of um, measuring an uh, uh, elder who's qualified for counsel, if they have not caught a charge, if their first name is Reverend, then you might want to double check that, okay? All right. Um, All right. And Dr. Davis said right. something that was striking to me. She said that some of us are not as radical as we think we are. So here we go again, crowd participation. Raise your hand if you really, really want to change this decadent system. Raise your hand. All right, keep your hand raised if you're willing to become an income tax war resistor in order to bring that about. Be honest, be honest, be honest. All right, be honest. All right. no, All right. no pictures. Thank no you pictures. very much. Thank you very much. You know, I, w I want to say something really quick, though, to speak. Wait, let me say something really quickly. I, I don't know if this is fully addressing your question, um, but I, I guess one thing that you said at the end did actually speak to me a little bit. You know, I don't really want to be recognized by the government. I want to overthrow the government. The government is the enforcer of the system that is oppressing us. And I honestly think that we have two problems. I think one of the problems is that we see ourselves only in the way in which they want to see us, which is how do we conduct our struggle in a way that adapts to the reform in the system that exists, not that the system itself is the problem, and secondarily, that we even think of ourselves as Americans. I mean, from the point of view of, of this, you know, what does, well, you know, John Lewis, when he was, was giving the speech he wouldn't give at the March on Washington, said, what's the civil rights bill to a maid that makes $10,000 a year? I mean, at the end of the day, if you are broke and poor and living on the street in Southeast, what do you really have in common with Muriel Bowser or a black person living in the Gold Coast? You have nothing in common with them. You have more in common with the workers in Bangladesh who died in the Gap factory. You just don't speak their language and you don't understand it. So until we recognize that we are citizens of the world and the only members of our country are the oppressed and exploited people struggling, we will get nowhere, and as long as, and I'm not saying we shouldn't make a demand of the government or try to get them to change something, but if we think that's the answer, then we've made a mistake. I think we have to approach every elections, laws, whatever it is from the point of view of advancing the consciousness of people to just get rid of this government. That's, I mean, that's, I don't know what else we can All right. do. All right, we have lots of, lots of hands up, so we're going to go here and I'm going to go upstairs, so get ready. Um. Hi, I, okay, my name is Peggy and I'm old. And I wanted to, 
I'm, I'm almost 70, okay? The, the average age of my friends, however, is probably 30. But I wanted to say this to the brilliant young woman who brought up the issue of counsel from elders. If I think you need to do a lot of research, find out who you want to be particular about, as you, as you mentioned, and once you decide, I think you should just call them up. And I do not believe they will say no. Uh, most of these elders are bored <laughs> because they are retired. They have a lot of time on their hands, and they're not invited to things anymore. So um, you should just, you know, call them, and you'll see what they say. And that's it. All right, the challenge is on. I'm going to go in the back first. I'm going to go in the back. I promise people in the back that they will get a hand. All right, are you guys ready? Thank you. Thank you. Let me go all the way in the back. I told them upstairs I would come up. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. All right. All right. Let's get started here on the stairs. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so my question was basically, um, I noticed a recurring issue, um, not saying that it's everybody, but it is a huge issue that I deal with, especially that people tend to constantly erase black Muslims from the, mu from the movement. And a lot of times, you know, I've been told, especially me personally, that I'm not really black and that I'm Muslim or like they racialized Islam basically, which is completely inaccurate. And especially in light of what happened with Ahmed, I thought that, you know, that was especially a really interesting time for the Black Lives Matter movement. And a lot of people were saying, oh, he's not really black, he's Sudani, he's, this is more about Islamophobia, but it wasn't more about Islamophobia, he was black. And I just wanted to ask basically, what's a way for us to move? Like I know there are Muslim representatives in this panel and there are Muslim people that do speak out on these issues, but what's a way for us to make it more, like to stop erasing black Muslims basically? Um. I don't necessarily, I, I guess I'm speaking for, for what we do in the city. Um, I don't really know what other chapters or things are doing. Um, but it's, it's really creating those spaces. And it, it's creating the spaces and making sure that people know that they exist. Um, so for example, we host Black Joy Sunday every Sunday in Malcolm X Park. And when it gets cold, we're gonna be in Anacostia doing a house party style. And it, we, are very, we are very particular, and ultimately when I say these, so emotional emancipation circles are on Wednesday. They're for all black people, right? Including you, sis, because you're my sister. And, it's said, and we say that in, um, in our guiding principles, it's talking about all black people. We talk about black Jews, black Muslims, black Christians, all black people. And so Wednesdays, we deal with the heavy stuff, processing trauma. On Sundays, we experience joy because it has to exist in the same, in the same time. You know? So we have that consistent space and it is for all black people. And I think when we, open, when we have these open spaces, having everyone come to know about it and then we start getting plugged in because I wanna know what, what you lead so I can amplify that and what that looks like and give you resources and support. But it's really us building community together is what's gonna change that. Um, and so come out to Black Joy Sunday, come to the Emotional Emancipation Circles. I would love, we would love to build with you, absolutely. Because I'm sure that you're doing fascinating, absolutely amazing work, and I want to be a part of it. I want to approach the question a little bit differently and talk about the importance of recognizing how Islamophobia has changed racism. And also the, the, the connections of solidarity that black people who are struggling in this country should um, experience with, for example, people in Palestine struggling for their liberation. So I think, you know, I think, I think that if we look at the history of racism, we see that it changes, it mutates, uh, it focuses on some groups, other groups, and this is the era when Islamophobia, particularly in the aftermath of 9-11, has, has fundamentally um, affected the way racist 
practices unfold. Now, if we look at what happened in Ferguson, the thing that, 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 that upset so many people all over the world was the fact that they saw tanks and they saw uh, uh, police who looked like they were fighting a war in some other part of the world. So we began to recognize that militarization is something that we have to take on. If we're gonna take on the police, we have to say, demilitarize the police. I mean, of course, eventually, eventually we have to say abolish the police, abolish policing as we know it, you know, just as we say abolish imprisonment. Andy called me a prison reformer, and I really don't like that term. I really, because I think prison reform has strengthened and made more permanent the institution of the prison, you know, over the last couple of centuries. So we have to talk about prison abolition. Uh, and, and solidarity with the struggle for justice in Palestine helps us to enrich and deepen our movements for abolition of policing and abolition of prisons. Hi. Um, First, I'd like to say thank you guys for being amazing and, and spending your time talking with us tonight. So I have a question related to something you said earlier about being ready to overthrow the government. And my question really relates to um, what are we, as a collective of people pushing for this goal, what do we have in mind to replace it with? From where do we find those sources that are pre European-centered references to, to replace the model with. How do we, as individuals all working towards this goal, like come up with ideas that don't unintentionally center whiteness and, and support white supremacy? And in line with that, what do we do with the Clarence Thomases as we, no, <laughs> as we push for that goal? Like how do you guys, as people who've been in this fight, on the forefront and visibly so deal with the pushback you get from people who look like us and who support our goal, but who really are there to infiltrate and undermine what we're aiming for. I think maybe Eugene, you should take that on. Uh, try that microphone that's next to you, see if that's working. Check one, two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. back. Uh, Great well, you question. Know, <laughs> First thing I want to say is, I, you know, I don't know if you can set anything up ahead of time that's definitely not going to do something else. I think even if we try to, you know, rectify the mistakes of the past, we're going to make mistakes going forward. So I think when we're envisioning a future, we shouldn't be looking at it just from the point of view of, well, how do we not you know, make it not do this or not do that 100%, but how do we do it the best we can, knowing that ultimately it's the struggle itself that's going to reveal to us the things that we have to do. You know, from my point of view, and I'm not here to tell anyone what to do, but I mean, it's, it's well known, you know, I'm a socialist, I'm a communist, that's what I believe in. I think there's 7 billion people in the world right now, everything about the way we use every bit of human energy is all to build up a system that enriches a tiny amount of people. I think we should start from a different starting point that every human being has the right to food, clothing, shelter, education, health care, the basic human rights, and that all of the productive capacities of humanity in a way that's sustainable with the planet have to be used to meet those needs and wants first and before anything else, and it has to happen collectively and democratically. So that's certainly what I believe. But again, I think that's the nature of this movement and this struggle is that a lot of us have a lot of different ideas about what we can do, how it can be structured, what it can go. And in the course of the, you know, I'm, I'm a unity struggle, unity guy too. In the course of us debating it, I think that's how we'll ultimately come to the answer and how we get there. I want to I say, uh, I got I to gotta quote Malcolm uh, because he, he said it best in, in, in my Sorry, opinion. And oh, basically when Harriet Tubman came, Wanted to, you know, let's run away from here. They ain't asked where we going. It was they like said, anywhere is better than here. But I would like to talk to you about where we going, okay? I really would. So we at radio, hit me. I would love to have a drink with you and really discuss that or where we go from here. But um, uh, I think that to answer some of her question, 
We just need to remove some things. Our structure is not fundamentally uh, flawed. It's just some things have to be removed. We don't have to burn this down tonight. We really don't. You know, I would enjoy doing it if we, if we had to go there, but I'm just saying it can be salvaged. We need to remove, like, for instance, electoral college. What the fuck is, do you know your popular vote does not elect the president? You, you do know that. You know that Jimmy Carter says that this is not a democracy? You do know that. You do, you do know that this is an oligarch, a, plur a plutocracy. You do not. Okay, as long as you got it. Because one of those things that we have to do is just acknowledge that the system is designed against us. You have to be a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant billionaire in order to enjoy your Americanness. So once we start changing that, I think we can change the system. So that, I think that we start there. Um, uh, but I really want to talk to that sister. I don't know where she went, but I really would like to have that conversation. I think you scared her off. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a, the, the, the gorilla in the just room. Just kidding. I think that's I'm the just gorilla kidding. in the room. Just kidding. You didn't so scare I, her off. I, I hope people have individual conversations about that, and I would love to hear what your responses are so we can start talking about framing a new world. Because once we can see it, I think we can achieve it. All right. We have another question from up here. Good evening, everybody. I think everybody uh, sees each other in this room, and I think we need to look around at the people that we're sitting next to and appreciate everybody that came out and everybody that is actually here besides the speakers that we have. I think it's very important that if we want to get together as a community, that we look at the people who are really sitting next to us and try to align ourselves that way as well. Um, I spent 18 years in South Africa, and I have to acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of similarities between what's happening here and what's happening there. One of the largest um, parts of, um, of separatism that I've seen here in the U.S. is the fact that educated black people or successful black people have a large concern with being in the hood. Now, whenever I go to South Africa, oh, sorry. Whenever I go to South Africa, that's where you're gonna find me the majority of the time. Now, from nine to five, I wear a suit and I play my part, but then after, I return to who I am. And I realize that that's not accepted where I go to from nine to five. So, one of the issues that I have concern is, is that we're not trying to bring who we are to nine to five. Because when we start speaking out, when we start using slang, it's kind of rejected. And it's not only rejected by the people that we work for, it's rejected by other people that we interact with within the black community as well. So I think that's really a large point of challenge. I, I, I listen to all types of music and that includes stuff that people don't really like or listen to. Okay, all right, sorry. Um, I really wanted to ask more about how we deal with the class issue then. Because if people don't want to participate in the hood and if you're not gonna look at the people around you, then how are we really going to unify and stop looking at the hood as, oh, I don't want to be there because it's too dangerous, or the only thing we signify is our educational institutions. You can say HU and you'll get a resounding response, but you can't say Ward 8 and get the same. I want to... Okay. Since, hey, since they brought up Ward 8, I need everybody in here right now to repeat after me since she brought up Ward 8. Say, the last frontier. Displacement free zone. Displacement free zone. All right. I'm going to give this to Erica and Dr. Davis, but I just want to acknowledge that I know personally, and you do too, a lot of sisters who feel compelled to straighten their hair or wear a wig on that job interview. So that is submission to that system right there. What I would have... So, hold up, y'all. Do you, Come on, you hold understand? On. So, do you understand what I was talking about earlier? Okay. So, what, what you probably should not, you can't talk as a black man, don't talk about our hair. Don't. That's, that's not your place. That's experience. That's experience. A lot of sisters feel no, compelled to do that's that. Not, but that's, that's not that's your experience. experience. That's not, that's, do not, I don't have hair. I don't have hair. Do not, just listen, I don't have listen hair. to me. 
Just listen. That's a lot of women's experience. I'm brother, I'm trying to save your life. Are you okay? got, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But a lot of women do that. So this, so again, so that goes back to what I said in the opening statement. You understand what I'm saying? You do not talk about black women's hair, period. Everyone that wears their hair straight is not trying to conform. That's not the case. So beyond that, what I would say is to the brother that was, um, that was speaking, um, when you said, when we, <laughs> it's so hard to swallow. You just can't, there's some things you just can't do. And you gotta be okay with that. Or not. Um, what I was saying um, to, to you, brother, is that like when you were talking about um, uh, not getting the response when you say Ward 8 and you saw that that was actually not the case in this room, a lot of time we have to check when we say black people don't, it's not black people don't, maybe the black people you know don't. You understand? So you got to recognize you, it's the company that you're keeping. All of us don't wear masks at our nine to five jobs. Some of us are very comfortable asserting our blackness in white spaces. And it took us a lot of time. Some of us, it took us some healing to get there and we do it. And we help other people be able to do it as well. So be very careful when you say black people don't, it's the black people that I hang around don't. But if you want to get into some new community of some liberated folk, then come to Black Joy Sunday. <laughs> experience that because it's not, it's beautiful out here. This movement is beautiful and we always are in Ward 8. That's where we go all the time. Um, so, and, but we go everywhere. So it's not, that may be your experience, but that's not black people as a whole. All right, and have... all the black men do not talk about black women's hair, period. I do. All right. We have, we have somebody here in the, oh, do you want? Okay. So I want to address the last question you raised, the more general question about class, because I think that is really important. Uh, um, and what I want to say is that uh, we don't recognize the extent to which the racism of this era has been produced by attacks on the working class writ large. And the fact that there are, it used to be that 30% of the entire labor force was unionized, and now it's less than 10%. And what's interesting is that as union membership has declined, prison populations have risen. And I'm thinking, I was, I was just looking at the demands that the Attica brothers made in 1971. Uh, and they were calling for the unionization of workers in prison. They wanted to create labor unions in prison. So I think this issue of class is often not discussed in a way that allows us to be clear about the, the, the character of this contemporary racism. You know, one of the reasons why there's so many black people and people of color and poor people in prison is because of global capitalism. And if you, if you look at the developments from the 1980s, the Reagan-Bush era to the present, you see, uh, the, you see the fact that people have lost jobs. Who are the first people to be fired? They're the last people to be hired. And they are black people and Latinos and Native Americans and, 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 and people of color. So I think that in the work that we do, we have to figure out how to bring, bring this question of class in, in, in an intersectional relationship with our notion of, of, of racism. And we have to figure out how to rebuild the labor movement in this country. 
because the, it was the labor movement that created a sense of international solidarity. And I know that for one, one of the reasons why I am free today is because unions all over the world, communist parties all over the world, organized around the demand for my freedom. And we are, and we are grateful for it. Uh, we, have, we have a question over here. We have a question over here, right, right here. Right over here. Hey, Eugene. Uh, uh, first off, I, I wanted to say that it, it's an amazing honor to, uh, to, to, to be in the same room as Angela Davis. Never thought that would happen in my lifetime. Um, so my question is, it's really directed at Kimon and Eugene. Um, so in the struggle, in the worldwide struggle uh, for liberation from capitalism, from the patriarchy, from uh, oppressive class systems. Uh, many of these revolutionary movements that have sprouted up in response to these systems of oppression are, have been started by women, they're run by women, they're, uh, women are at the front lines, but you're seeing men taking a lot of the credit for the accomplishments of these brave women. So my question is, how has men, how, being a man and, and asking other men, like, how, as a man, can we support these women? How can we lift them up? How can we elevate them? Because if they're running everything, if they're leading everything, why the hell are we talking? <laughs> did, did that make sense? I think it does. I mean, I, I think the answer is actually pretty simple. Uh, there's a saying that says, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. So if women are leading everything, it shouldn't be that hard to lift them up because you should just look at what's actually happening and express it truthfully. Uh, so if it's not happening, then I think you have to recognize from yourself that you aren't really looking at what's happening in a, in a real way, which is obviously hurting your work. I don't know if there's any you know, super special example I, you know, I can give you, I, I try not to take credit for anything that I don't do, but I think that ultimately if we're gonna say things are being led by someone, we have to lift them up based on that truth. I mean, I don't know what else to do but to express the truth of what's happening. Um, my answer to that would be to ask us, just ask, how can we support you? The women that are doing work, ask how can we support you? And listen when we say how you can support. I, I just gotta say, black is not synonymous with progressive, and women are not synonymous with progressive. Margaret Thatcher, uh, Connie Rice, uh, Mira Bowser, uh. So, so we gotta be very careful. It's not assigned to gender, it's not assigned to race, it's assigned to right and wrong. And if more of the sisters are right, more power to them, we should, the men should then fall back and protect them. I wanna see more men standing up protecting these sisters. I want to see more, if I saw um, a police officer sit on a woman's chest, punching her in the face on the side of the road, and you think I would drive by? A lot of us would. We need to stand up and be men in those situations. I haven't seen men pulling cops off of these women. I want to see that happen. So I just want to make sure that was pointed out. Okay. Is this working? So what I would like to suggest is that we have, to, we, we have to be really critical about these ideologies of protectionism. Because these are the ideologies of male supremacy. And it seems to me that if progressive men really want to do something worthwhile, it, is, it would be to take on some of the issues that have been considered women's issues that men ought to, have been, ought to be dealing with in the first place. So what about violence against women? What about gender violence? It seems to me that that is the way men can 
begin to make a major difference in our struggles. All right, we have, right over here, we have another question. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis and our amazing panelists. My question is, what is most effective for radicalizing institutions such as historically black colleges and universities and black churches that have great potential to, pr to advance black liberation? Thank you. All right, I think somebody here. Right here, over here. Uh, well, <laughs> having gone to a historically black college and university, having known many people who do, I don't think that task is actually possible. I mean, I, I think that the institutions that exist in our society it don't exist in a vacuum. It's not as if they're just sort of there and are de separate from everything else. But you know, having gone to Howard, for instance, it serves a political purpose. That's why the president of Howard is so consistently meeting with the president, with Congress, and there's sort of a sweetheart deal that if you keep the students on campus locked on campus, uh, if you you know help perpetuate the idea that people from D.C. are locals, if you you know say before they've ever done one thing that the slogan of the university, I mean, the first week I was there, they said, oh, well, the slogan is leadership for America and the global community. You've never even done anything, and they're telling you that you lead in the world. And I think that we have to recognize that it's not about radicalizing the institution. It's about radicalizing the people who are there to understand the role of the institution. And also pay attention to the who's on the board of trustees. You'd be very surprised. This young man's father, Howard Zinn, who is one of the greatest historians this country has ever produced, was fired by Spellman because he was too radical for that institution. So you got to pay attention to where the money is coming from, and that would be your answer and your salvation. Hi, still, hi thank, you, thank you all for being here. I have a question. Um, that goes back to, well, just to put it out there, the Democratic Party, because we're entering an election year, obviously 2016, you know, everybody's gonna be pushing to get out the vote, but when you look at somebody like Hillary Clinton, she per perpetuated the prison industrial complex in 1994 with the crime Ooh, bill, expanding the prison Hillary. population, expanding the number of things you could get the death penalty for, putting 100,000 more cops on the streets, um, this is the, the kind of person that's going to be the front runner of the Democratic Party. And I think my question is basically, if the Democratic Party is oftentimes the graveyard of social movements, then how does Black Lives Matter or the movement for black lives stay relevant in a year when we're going to be pushed to join the Democrats and support the Democrats and get out the vote for a war hawk, white supremacist prison builder? All right, real quick, who, who's in here ready for Hillary? Raise your hand if you're ready for Hillary. Really? I'm so, okay, we're in a good room. We're in a good crowd. It's a nice crowd here. I like it. I like that. I'm going I'm to give that, I'm going to get that one out. I had to get, I had to get a little poll right there. Well, you know, having run for office before, you know, Andy was kind enough to mention I, I run for the statehood Green Party. The only way to really stay relevant is to create our own vehicles. I mean, it's not possible. The Democrat, I mean, if you look at what's happening right now, the reason why all the Democrats are jumping on Black Lives Matter is because they know not one substantive piece of legislation can pass Congress in the next year. And so what they're doing is they're showing that the DNC is passing resolution, they're meeting with people, they're tweeting out the pictures, because all they want to do is show like, yes, we're down with that, but what you don't see them doing is denouncing the Democratic mayors that are perpetuating a lot of this uh, militarized policing. So it's all cosmetic, and you can't go to something, I mean, you know, I, I came up in the anti-war movement, and we went through this in 2006, where the Democrats won the both houses of Congress on the basis of saying they were against the war. Barack Obama was elected, they said they were gonna do all this, they controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency, and they did nothing they were gonna say. So I mean, eventually you have to say these people aren't going to do anything. You have to create your own vehicles, whatever that may be, and it's not just in the electoral system, but to make it relevant. Uh, this is something I try to do. I ran for city council. I'm running for the second time for vice president this year on a socialist ticket to wake people up, to raise consciousness. We're not going to win every single election, but we have to get in there and we have to raise consciousness in this system to change this system. If we go to the Democrats, they'll treat us like they always have. Look at the labor movement. We're talking about rebuilding the labor movement. Great point. 
They vote for the same people every time. They get less and less every time. So I think ultimately we just have to be intelligent, but it's not about just having ideology. It's about learning from history. I want to say real quick, third party politics, did you not know 5% of the vote would then get them entered into the debates? 5%. So throw away that thing, oh, they can't win. They don't have to win. Only 5% of the national vote. So if you want to really have a protest vote, then I urge you to make sure you, you, you place your ballot with a third party candidate. 5% is all that's needed for them, the coffers, to be opened up, and then they'll be allowed into debates, and maybe we'll have an honest conversation. All right, so um, I want to be mindful of time. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Davis. Okay. Um, somehow, we always think when elections roll around that our role is to elect the best candidate. And then what often happens is that if the best candidate wins, then we go home and, and, and stop mobilizing and stop organizing. And this is what happened with the Obama administration. We assume, well, many of us thought he was going to be our savior, right? But, but if the movement that enabled his election had not, had, had not, um, uh, become dismantled if we had been out there in the streets organizing, mobilizing for health care against Guantanamo, against Afghanistan. It might have been very different. So my answer to your question is going to be the fact that um, we need to intensify and accelerate our organizing. We need to try to, try to create a movement that can put pressure on whoever is elected. Now, now I don't. Um, I, I only voted for a Democrat twice in my life, and and that was when Obama ran. Otherwise, I've I've always voted third party, Communist Party, Green Party, Peace and Freedom Party, and I do think eventually we are going to have to create a powerful independent political party. That is the only way out of a situation where both major parties are, are getting their messages from capitalist corporations. Uh, so yeah, I don't think it's going to be the Democrats or the, well, definitely not the Republicans, but we need you know, we need a new party. We need a new party. And I think we need to start laying the groundwork for that right now, during this election, during this period. I would just add to that um, and, and echoing that with one of the things that we're trying to do also is political education. And so we have to be able to educate folks on how and what ways they're impacted and really just make it clear, make it plain and so if that is your expertise, if that's a way for you to, to, to wake people up, then contact us. Everybody has a role in this movement. So we have to stop thinking. A lot of times I hear critiques of this is missing from the movement and this is missing. It's missing because you're not doing it. We need you. So contact us, blacklivesmatterdmv at gmail.com. If you have ideas, build a, build a network of people that want to do political education work. And then find a space, or we can support find a space, don't, but don't come to us and say, this is what needs to happen, and then you roll out. Do it. Join, join with us, and we can help support it because we need it. We can't do it all by ourselves. And while we're, while we're on the subject of uh, uh, electoral politics, what we were talking about earlier, what do you think about the Bernie Sanders phenomenon? Is that, is that much of the same, or do you see it as something new and different and fresh? Erica had the pleasure of meeting with him, so she is best qualified to respond to that. Yikes. Um, for me, part... I was one of six other people in the room. And for me, um, my role really was to, that I created was to push back on what I heard. Um, I, 
I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed. Um, I don't really know a whole lot about his history, but the talking point of I'm the most progressive candidate is not enough for me. And, and that is what he consistently kept saying. Um, it's not enough for me. I'm not telling you what to do, but it's not enough for me. I didn't hear um, what I needed to hear and what I wanted to hear. Um, and even kind of asking questions to kind of pull the answer out, if it was there, I didn't hear that. So ultimately what we did in that meeting was push back on his racial justice platform and push back on it needs some teeth. And we need to see some other, we need to see building black wealth there. We need to see all, so many things. It's, it was just a lot. Um, I think folks need to do better at listening. Presidential candidates need to do better at listening other than spitting out talking points. Um, and I also will say that I feel like presidential candidates need to take implicit bias tests. That should be a part of the requirement. Shalal, let me say this real quick. Um, I want to make sure that everyone is acutely aware that the Black Lives Matter movement was created during Obama's watch. A black president and two black attorney generals. I met with the president of the Fraternal Order of Police. I met with the uh, president of the um, police, Associ uh, police Union. And I can tell you, just like when we were kids and we were rooting for Dukes of Hazzards and the General Lee and the good old boys, we've been duped. These guys are part of that good old boy network. And what they have been doing is basically saying, despite who black faces in the high places, you know who's really in charge. It is not your imagination that things have escalated because they're looking at the browning of America and they want to make sure that they remind us that they can rain down on us at any time. It doesn't matter who's in charge. They want to make sure we, we stayed in our place. And even though if Bar Bar uh, Bernie, Bernie was sincere in saying that he's the most progressive candidate, progressive compared to what? You see what I'm saying? You know, you know, so I just want to put that out there. So we need to make sure that these faces and whatnot. Now, I think after we have gotten past the Obama phenomenon, because even if Angela Davis voted for him twice, then we have all been disappointed. Have we, can we admit that now? No. You can't admit that? No. Then you're not familiar with his voting record, sir. Amen. And you're impressed with the image. Uh -huh. Symbolism over substance. Because... I can, I can run down the list of things that he has done that is a detriment not only to black people, but to the world in general. The National Defense Authorization Act, where they can incarcerate people without charge and hold them indefinitely, is the top of the list. And we can go on. I would love to have a conversation with you if you buy the drink, because I'm going to be educating All right. you. Okay. All right. I think, um, I think we're about ready to, to, to wrap this up. I know there's, there's a lot of hands. There's a lot of hands up there, and, and I want to I want to make sure that. Uh, okay, I just want to. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I just would like to say one thing. Um, um, you know, I don't necessarily believe in the lesser of the two evils, but I do think it is important that someone like Bernie Sanders, even with all of his limitations and all of his problems, as you know too well. Um, it's important that he's raising the issue of socialism. And I think that we have to take it and to transform it into the kind of discourse that will um, make it possible for us to be far more critical of capitalism than we've ever been in this recent era. So, you know, I think that's our role as a movement. Uh, we, we do that. Uh, we, we talk about free education. Um, and the fact that Obama pointed out just at the NAACP speech, NAACP speech that he gave, uh, and it's, I mean, it's like seven years too late, of course, <laughs> that the $80 billion that goes into the prison system every year could actually be used to provide free tuition at every public <laughs> university in this country. So I think we need to use these things as, and, 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 and organize in a way that's going to increase the 
radical awareness and radical consciousness of people in this country. So am I, am I hearing you're going to be voting Democrat for a third time? No, no, that's no. not what I said. No, no, just, just joking. That's, that's not all. what I said. Just that's checking. That's not what I said. That's I'm all. I'm talking about the work we do when we are given this arena of uh, that. This is the only time that everybody in the country is politicized. And we have to take advantage of that in the work, the, the organizing we do, the mobilizing we, we do. So, now, so how about how about Bernie Sanders? If he was to be the nominee for the party, would you vote for you him? Like Bernie, don't you? No, I, I, I don't know. Just saying well, socialism. Well, I'm not a Democrat. You know, I'm really not a Democrat. I'm a communist. So, okay. so I can say that strategically, strategically, I might vote for him. Yeah. Uh, I think it's so important that we elected Obama and we didn't elect. John McCain, what would the world have been like had McCain been president? So with all of the criticisms we have of Obama, and I have a long, 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 long list of them, I also recognize that certain things that have happened over these last eight years could not have happened except under the Obama administration. It would have been a lot and, easier to organize. And, 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 and it's not so much because Obama, the individual, was elected. It's because of the work that masses of people did in this country to create a new consciousness. So that is how I approach elections, as opportunities would, for raising mass consciousness. I agree with you. Uh, so I wanted, I wanted to, uh, I, know, I know there's a lot of hands. We're not going to be able to get to you. I apologize uh, because I want to be respectful of the time of the panelists. Uh, I want to be able to, oftentimes we have these conversations and people come to these events thinking that they're going to get the answers, that they're going to walk away from experts that are going to tell them what is the way forward. And the reality is that each and every one of you is an expert that if we are to constantly be waiting for panelists to tell us what to do, we'll never be able to move forward. So I just want to be clear here that a lot of people in this room have networks and connections and people they know that can create all kinds of movements, whether it's a Black Lives Movement, whether it's, uh, it's the Occupy. Uh, a lot of people did not think Occupy did anything. It did an awful lot. It made a lot of change. And, and, People were saying, well, Occupy has no leadership. It has no head. It has no tail. What is going on? Well, that's not necessarily true. Sometimes you don't need to have structures that you can easily define. Sometimes structure define themselves as you start moving down that path of social change. So I want to thank all of you for being here and for being a part of this conversation and to understand that the, as Dr. Davis mentioned and as so many others in this panel mentioned, that it's not enough to just come to this and say you were involved in the movement and now you go home and do exactly what you were doing before. It's important to come to these to get energized. This is an opportunity to get energized so you can go and do something. As Kimo Freeman so beautifully says with his We Act Radio, it's do something. So I want to uh, just quickly give you some closing remarks if you'd like to make them. And then before you go, we have a, a poem we're going to send you with from our own Rebecca Dupas, who is a, uh, a, 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 she's a host here uh, at Busboys of Poets. She does beautiful poetry. I'm going to give her the opportunity to read you a poem before we go, because we need to all go uplifted in spirit. So let's, let's uh, have our panelists uh, just give some, absolutely, yep. Well, if, if I, first of all, thank you to the audience. I thought we had a fantastic conversation and to all of my co-panelists. I guess if I had to leave you with one thing, I would say that at the end of the day, we have to recognize that this struggle is a struggle for power. If we look at what's happening right now in this country, every social gain that was ever won, every reform that was ever won is being rolled back. And that they might give you something one day, and at the first chance they get, they're going to take it back. It's not a conspiracy. It's not a cabal. There's a set group of 
people with a lot of money who are controlling this system and keeping people down. And if we don't take the power from them and invest the power in us, then we will be back here 30 years from now talking about how unfortunate it is that all the changes that the Black Lives Matter movement wrought are being rolled back again. So we have to be clear. It is a struggle for power, not recognition, a struggle for power. I just want to say that we need to vote with our dollars. We need to vote with our dollars. And we need to pray with our feet. That's what we need to do. I hope everybody can walk out here repeating that. We need to vote with our dollars and pray with our feet. All right? For those who do not know, uh, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, uh, these are notorious profiteers of privatized prisons and their labor. If you're banking with them, you part of the problem. We need to vote with our dollars and pray with our feet, okay? I think after the Obama phenomenon of substance, uh, of symbolism over substance, we should come to the realization that we need to actually do more, okay? As Dr. Davis said, that we can't just vote and go home. We have to actually do something, all right? So I hope that each and every one of you will become uh, more active in, in, in your community engagement I think that each and every one of us has the power to change this system if we so desire to do so. I think that we need to look um, beyond our differences and our issues uh, eternally with each other and focus on what it is that we agree upon. If you agree with a person on one thing, then that one thing should be the basis of your relationship. You know, we should not focus on what separates us. We should focus on what brings us together because the system is based upon divide and conquer. So I want to make sure that everyone walks out of here knowing that we need to vote with our dollars and pray with our feet. And please, by all means, do something. We Act Radio. Um, so I would say the doors of the movement are open. Won't you come? Um, <laughs> um, join something. Um, or start, there you go. That's why I, that's why I keep you, her around me, y'all. Um, yeah, join something or start something. Um, Black Joy Sunday is a place that we do community building, um, emotional emancipation circles. Every Wednesday is where we process the trauma of just being black. Um, and that in that understanding, that's moving us to action. So if you don't know what your role is in the movement or if you're not really confident, join these community building spaces and we can help, we can tell you what it is that we see in you. And it's a loving environment that is going to support you in finding your role in the movement. Um, and I would say also, um, similar to what Kamon is saying, but a, a little spin, um, it's also important, yes, joining people that have the same cause but understanding the ways in which you are divisive. And in many cases, that is internalized white supremacy, misogyny, homophobia, all those things. If that is within you, I can't do work with you because you are automatically marginalizing and pushing out people that I love, black people. And so if you're not in that vein, if you do not come with the understanding of intersectionality in the framework of doing work, I can't fuck with you. I can't. However, if you are willing to learn and listen, there are spaces for that as well. My wonderful, wonderful partner, Aaron Goggins, is, yes, give it up for Aaron. Brilliant brother, brilliant, has a space um, for men called Reenvisioning Masculinity. It's a feminist workshop for men. For men to be able to come and bring all their shit because y'all got it. We do too, but we working on our stuff. Y'all got to work on yours before you speak about ours, right? So we have that space, particularly because of what we've seen in this movement, that you all need a space to be able to come and decolonize some of that stuff, right? And do it among people who get it and listen. And so we come with that space. You got to pay us, though, because it's labor, right? And y'all make more than us. Okay, so give what you can. But when we're doing this, knowing that this is a space that's judgment-free, we're going to call you out 
will call you in when we hear something, but this is a place for you to, to begin to deconstruct. So if you have a lot of women around you that are saying you problematic, listen to them and come to this space and work that shit out before you come and try to organize and things like that with us. You can do that on your own, but the, the movement for black lives, we're talking about all black lives. And if you don't understand that, and if you're, what you're doing is toxic, if you have ideologies that you have inherited from the oppressor, we will gladly tell you what those are. And if you wanna do the work on yourself, we got a space for you. If not, we can send you on your way and work is still gonna get done. So we love you. Join the movement, Black Joy Sundays, Malcolm X Park, 4 to 6 p.m. We got Double Dutch, we got Bubbles, it's for the kids, all of that. Um, if you're on Twitter, I'm two, the number two, Live Unchained um, on Twitter, and I'll tweet out those graphics. Erica Totten on Facebook, and to Live Unchained on Instagram. That's where we post a lot of our stuff. So elders, go ahead and get you a Twitter account for social justice. <laughs> Just for social justice, if you want to know what's happening, we're talking on Twitter. We, a lot of us are organizing on Twitter, so get you an account. My mama got about to get an account, so y'all can get an account too. So uh, to Live Unchained on Twitter. And I'll tweet out the information that I just shared with you all. I'll do that now so you can find it there. Dr. Davis, Mr. Shalal, please forgive me. Five seconds. I forgot to mention this. This is very important. I need everyone to become a member of WPFW, support your public radio stations, support your public access television, DCTV, WHUT, you need to be a part of it. You need to stop being consumers of media, become producers of media, and once we begin to tell our own stories, things will begin to change. We need to all do that. Too many of y'all are watching CNN, which is Conservative News Network, Fox News calling the entertainment. We need to pay we attention you, to where we get we information. Love you, come on. Let's, all right. Yeah, Just had to put you. that out there. Okay. Well, I want to end by thanking all of you who have come out this evening. This has been an amazing event. Um, you know, I think, I think I'm falling in love with DC. And so I want to thank, I really want to thank Andy Shalal for this wonderful space and all of the work that he's done. But I do want to end on a serious note. Uh, I, I, I want to make an appeal. Um, all of you are familiar with Mumia Abu-Jamal, right? And, and he has hepatitis C, advanced hepatitis C. And there is a cure. There is a cure, but the prison will not provide the medication that he needs, but they, they argue that it costs too much. Apparently it costs something like $90,000 for. So what we need to do is to, first of all, persuade other people to demand that Mumia receive the treatment that he deserves. Mumia is our spokesperson. He has done so much from death row and now from his prison cell. He has spoken to people all over the world. And as a matter of fact, if you go to towns in France and Germany, you will find streets named after Mumia Abu Jamal. And it's, it's because of the fact that the police have mobilized to prevent people from becoming aware of the real facts in the case, that we haven't been able to build the kind of movement that would have by now freed him. So I want, I want to end by saying that, that given the fact that Obama um, seems to be concerned about his legacy now, and he's doing things like he's the first sitting president to have ever visited a prison, let's tell him, let's tell him that he can acquire a legacy that people re will remember for hundreds of years by freeing 
Mumia Abu Jabal, and all political prisoners in this country. Thank all right. you. All right. Okay. So, so we can't send you on your way without giving you a little uplift. So we have a, a poem that's going to be read, and then we have a special gift. So please stay for five more minutes. I assure you, five more minutes, you'll be out of here if you need to. So please stay where you are. Keep it quiet so we can listen to this, and then you'll be in for a treat. All right? This is Rebecca Dupas. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. All right, so um, I'm going to have to get my nerves together.